This is one of those gospels that are being proclaimed in hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of churches around the world. It's taken from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning with verse 21 and ending with verse 43. It's familiar, but in order for the familiarity to go deeper than just that familiarity, just be with the crowd. Place yourself in your imagination. And the imagination helps us to connect with what is real. This gospel is happening now, each in our own way, as we hear. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman <clears throat> was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. <clears throat> when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, the hem of his garment. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you. His disciples said, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed, be freed from your suffering. <clears throat> While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him <clears throat> except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them, Give her something to eat. My brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Isn't it curious that the woman had menstrual problems for 12 years, and the little girl was 12 years old? And so this woman, the woman who touched the hem of his garment, we're going to celebrate her in a special way, not to minimize the beauty 
of raising the daughter of Jairus to life. But this woman, let's just get in touch with this. You know, in Hebrew uh, purifications, that time of a month for a woman, she would go to a miklim, I think I got that word right, to be ritually bathed and then return to her husband. Looks like this lady spent most of her time there. Nobody could touch her. Nobody could, near, could go near her. If she were married 12 years, 12 years ago, I don't think this was working out so well. So the woman was isolated from community. Not only did she have this suffering, which is dangerous for a woman to have a constant bleed, but she was isolated. Nobody could get near her. But she saw something in Jesus. Not just that he was a healer in that miracle worker sense of the word, but she read his compassion. That's what drew her to him, his compassion. She wanted to be near that compassion. She wanted to touch it as best that she could because that compassion has power. Compassion, my brothers and sisters, has power. Not the nice and simple, have a good week, nice day kind of thing, or we like each other. No, we're talking about love to the point where it touches the gift of the Spirit, which is love, in terms of compassion. Later, I'll come back to that theme, because we need compassion for each other. Full, complete compassion, because that's where the power is. So here this woman approaches, and she gets near to that source of compassion and touches it. And Jesus felt that power move out from him. But notice his response. He said to her, your faith has made you whole. Don't confuse me to be a miracle worker. That's what makes the crowds real attractive. They want a miracle without touching compassion. That's why he told the people around after Jairus' daughter was raised, don't tell anybody about this. Good luck on that one. Somebody's raised from the dead, and they say, don't tell anybody. There's a theme in Mark's gospel called the messianic secret. All through Mark's gospel, you have the, shh, don't tell anybody that he's the Messiah, because they did not want him to be misunderstood. They wanted a Messiah that would go right down into the throes of the center of Jerusalem and maybe even get on to Rome and reclaim Jerusalem for God's place, not Rome's place. But Jesus didn't want to do that. He didn't want to isolate his power in that way. His power was different. His power was love. And that's the power that we have all been given. And we need to simply tap into that. It's wonderful that we can go down the aisle now after a year and a half or so of waving at people, have a good week when we do the greeting of peace, have a good time, you know. We can greet one another because touch has power, particularly if it's filled with compassion. There was a situation, and I don't know that it's any different now, in Romania of hundreds of thousands of orphaned children who lie there, untouched, uncared for, maybe fed from a machine-like response from the people there. And their brains shrink. Some die because the importance of being able to touch one another in one way or another, we did our best over the last year and a half, because it's touching to sing a hymn. We use that expression, I was touched by the artwork of Crystal White, which, uh, that, we saw, that we see projected there. Touched by that. Art can touch us. Love can touch us. But touch can also touch us. And that's what we need to be able to be grateful to God that we're opening ourselves to this because there's much power in the gift of touch. Many years ago when I was in the seminary, um, 
You know, when, when somebody bumps into you, like on the subway or someplace, you say, excuse me? He said, you know what we really ought to say? We ought to say, thank you, <laughs> to the person, rather than excuse me. Yes, we don't want to inappropriately or bump into somebody, but we can thank each other for the closeness that we can have and for the ability to touch one another. What about the assembly, my brothers and sisters? What about the assembly? You've heard me speak about this uh, on other times. I want to just bring it up again in the context of the 10th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, this day is not just the day at the, the last day, the end of the world. This is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. So every time you allow yourself to be moved by compassion in some way. Just got a text from our dear friends in Vineland. Uh, Tony goes out to get coffee for his wife, Denise. Dear friends we've had for 15 or so years, lost count. When he comes up to the side thing on, on uh, Dunkin' Donuts, first the, first the car ahead of you paid for you. One of those gratuitous acts of kindness that have us go, who is that person? The acts of kindness when we were inundated with snow back in February. A lady about four houses down the street came by and I heard all this noise, and she was cleaning it up. And I went out to see who it was. And as she was walking, I said, no, you caught me, kiddingly saying, you know, I'm the one that did that. That kindness. Look for it. Search for it. Don't settle for just letting it go. Every moment of our life is a moment to be kind, because we have been given the same power of compassion of Jesus. That's what our baptism, that's what confirmation is about. That's what the gift of the Holy Spirit is about. It's not withdrawn from us as though we have to keep pleading for the Spirit. What we need to do is to simply plead that the blockages that we've created between us and the next act of compassion are removed. Removed. So that there is no space, or we don't have to fight through a crowd in order to touch somebody. That we're there, and we can give grace and peace to so many people. Lord God, I just thank you that you have made us so much ready to move on. To move on to reclaim Matawan United Methodist Church the beauty of this structure and its capacity to fill 300 people that are longing to see each other, greet each other, touch each other, and sing together like we've never sung before. That has power, dear Lord. And once again, I ask you to awaken to those that are near enough to be here, and there are some that aren't, and they're joining us virtually, and maybe even actually become members of the congregation, who are in Forked River or in Kearney, Florida, Puerto Rico, or when we come to pray, Uganda, the time of prayer, I'm going to celebrate our Ugandan son, Jack, and how we pray, but I'll come to that when that prayer time comes. We need to be touched by the power of God, which we've all been given. Claim it, my brothers and sisters. Don't just settle for the routine of viewing online, or even the routine of just coming to church. Because that routine can mask and can weaken the power of compassion that God has given to each one of us. Lord God, I pray that we would just be wide open to that gift of compassion and live it to the full in surprising ways kindness, through surprises, through the wonderful ways that you express your love for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
We met Jack and Gilbert in 2006 when they came to our church in Vineland with Watoto, this marvelous ministry for the orphans of Uganda. Jack at that time was probably 11 or 12 years old. He was 10? He was 10. And I was just caught by the way he, he had various children introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Jackson. He danced and he sang, and it was just a marvelous, marvelous time. And Gilbert and Jack have been close to us, the closest we can have to have sons from Uganda. We can't actually uh, adopt them because you've got to live in Uganda for a while and so on. But Uganda is in grave trouble right now, along with Kenya, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and much of Africa. One percent of the population of Africa have been vaccinated. One percent. And it's raging. The virus is raging in that country. Even as we begin to back away, begin to breathe a sigh of relief, it's surging in other parts of the world. India, Brazil, you name it. So Jack is about seven. He's listening to us right now. It's probably about six o'clock in Kampala, Uganda. He joins us online. And every morning, he's been sending me prayers. And a couple of days ago, he sent this prayer. That I'd like to pray this with you as we begin this time of prayer together. Hey, Dad, how are you? Yes, I always connected and I'm always blessed for sure. Thanks for sure. I was blessed. Each morning we wake, another day consumed by the news of the coronavirus. Another day facing the same space, the same colors, the same sounds. We crave for the freedom we had, the freedom we are used to, and the people we met. As the tears form, please, Lord Jesus, Fill my uncertainties with peace and strength. We have always needed it, but now we know it. We pray for all who are facing isolation, hardship, hunger, fear, or anxiety. Lord, let them know that you are close and guide us while we have time, energy, or resources to reach out and bring relief. We should have always done this, but... Now we know it. We pray for all those who are sacrificing safety and comfort so that others can be saved for doctors and nurses and care workers. Fill them with your spirit and let them know that they walk in your footsteps. Should have always been this way, but now we feel it. Through this time, help us to draw together in spirit even while we are apart. Help us to seek out the lost and the lonely and to know that in all circumstances, however dark things may seem, we are loved and we are eternally safe. Your love has always been like this. Help us to know it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay safe, Mama and Dad, and everyone else. Love you.